as we want to study and look at this conversation, Jesus had a number of conversations with individuals that stands out in our minds, and this is one of those. And for a number of reasons. One is that he's a ruler of the Jews. He's one of the Sanhedrin. But probably more than anything else that we think of Nicodemus in positive terms. He seems to be one that really wanted to know when he asked questions of Jesus what the answer was. And many of the other Jewish leaders were trying to trap Jesus or trying to trick him or trying to find fault with him. Whereas Nicodemus really wanted to know some answers to some very important questions. And usually when we think about John the third chapter, we look at the passages from verse 4 on down, which talks about entering the kingdom of heaven. But I want to notice for a few minutes that what he talks about to Jesus and, and how he starts off this conversation. And therefore, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I think it's significant to notice, first of all, that here he is a Pharisee. We tend today to think of the Pharisees as a very negative light because of the reasons I mentioned earlier in our lesson. And that many of them were not fair, they were hypocritical, and they were trying to trap Jesus. But really, Pharisees meant that they were going by the law. That's what Daniel, for the Daniel that he preached the lesson about, am I a Pharisee? Am I going by what the law says? That's, that's a good thing when we do it the right way. And so when he talks about Jesus, he says to him that you are a good teacher. And if you thought about that, there's a part to the role of teachers in our lives. And, and, and religion and our lives in many different ways. And that is that teachers have a great amount of influence. In fact, their influence will live on for years and years after the student leaves their class. That many of us can recall teachers we had maybe back in high school or what, what you used to call junior high school, I guess today called middle school or elementary class. I can tell you about a Miss Bynes, which was my fifth grade teacher, that, and she was without doubt, and I say that this without hesitation, she was probably the meanest fifth grade teacher the world's ever known. And however, as I was in her class, at least that's the way I thought about her, but I looked back and realized I learned a lot in her class. And there may be other teachers you think of because a, a favorite subject you have with them, or maybe some kind of personal praise they had, and again, all of this goes to testify for the fact that they influence us much longer than what we're inside their classroom. There's a picture of a teacher of the students. And back in the 1970s, there was a solar eclipse. And they had made a promise that they would come together at the next solar eclipse that was going to occur in their region. And of course, our last solar eclipse was on April the 8th of this year. And there's a picture of that teacher with the students they had in his class back in 1970, which means about 70, or excuse me, 50 years later, that they came together to be at his house to observe the solar eclipse. And think about that, the, the effort that took, and the travel, the distance that Mio had, had traveled, and the age that they were getting to besides that of the teacher. And that just tells me there's a lot involved. Now, they thought highly of that teacher to make that effort to be there. And not only that about teachers, that teachers are, students are better or worse because of being in their class. And, and that is the content of what they taught in that class can, can either be either right or wrong. And then we make decisions based on what they have taught us. And again, it influences us in a lot of ways. We may talk about teachers in such ways such as, you know, that teacher was boring. I used to like that subject until I got into her class or into his class. Or maybe that they were, they always made it inspiring. They, they were able to get me to interested in something I never thought about before. And, and because of that person, I went to that field of study. Or maybe like in a movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off, 
when the students are in the classroom and they're watching one of those old movies that's on real to real and it talks about prehistoric man and the dinosaurs and the teacher as he's talking about it is in this monotone vo voice where all the students have fallen asleep. And that may be also what you're thinking about with certain teachers, but they, they teach us for better or worse. And not only that, but also teachers are described as many adjectives. We talk about them and we say, well, that was a good teacher. Yeah, that, that was a bad teacher. That was a teacher that was timely. And other kind of descriptions like that. And you stop thinking about Nicodemus as he talks about Jesus. And here's a rule of the Jews, a Pharisee. And well, how does he describe Jesus? He says, you are a teacher from God. Now, I don't know how many times Nicodemus would have said that about somebody. But he said that about Jesus. That you are a teacher from God. And knowing that, God said, a worker of miracles. Many of the Jewish rulers later on, we either try to discredit the miracles of Jesus or ascribe them to the power of Beelzebub. But this man here did not put any if, ands, or buts to it. He says, you are a worker of miracles. That's high praise to give anybody. And in this lesson, we want to focus on the things we should do. And we're going to let Jesus teach us. But honestly, I was just thinking about this. that Teachers comes highly recommended. And that is that you look at it. There's all kinds of things teachers do. They finish their studies so as to get a degree. And if they put in applications someplace, you want to find out what their area of study have been, uh, have been, maybe how long, if they've been teaching, how long they've been at the school. And uh, maybe look at some things like the experience they've had, number of years in the classroom, and even references. They have, uh, who is willing to vouch for this person? And you look at the references they have. And I remember when I tried out one place, and later on I found out that I basically got the job there because of two reasons. And one was, as was at their time of preaching on Sunday morning, uh, our children at this point were really small, like five, three, and one, so on, on that lines there. And Regina got a, a coffee fit and had to leave the auditorium for a few minutes, and our children actually stayed there and just sat in the pew until Mama came back. That impressed everybody. Had nothing to do with me. But that impressed everybody. The second thing is, when the references that, that I get, gave them, I gave a reference of a preacher by the name of Raymond Harris. And however, when they saw that, they saw Raymond Harville. Totally different preacher. Raymond Harville at that congregation had a great reputation. Raymond Harris, they had no idea who he was. And later on, I found out that they thought that Raymond Harville had recommended me, and therefore, that's how, why I got the job. And again, nothing to do with me. They just misread the, the name on it. But generally, we want good references for teachers, right? And so we look at this here, and character. Maybe some character references, all those things come together. And so let's look here at the resume of Jesus. And one thing we say about Jesus, and John points out to us, that he existed in the beginning. In fact, that's how John starts out his gospel, isn't it? And that is gospel of John in the first chapter, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And so this Word is co-equal with God. He is the same as deity, then, as we talk about this here. And verse 14, he points out to us that this word became flesh, so he identifies the word as Jesus here. But he says, okay, that he was in the beginning. Who better to talk about creation than Jesus? Who better to talk about and ask questions about the purpose of marriage, as they did in Matthew 19 chapter, than Jesus? Because if Jesus was there when God instituted the marriage relationship, and Jesus could talk about the flood of Noah. He could talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. He could talk about those events, not as a history student as we would, but as one that was present at that place and knew what was going on. In fact, as he talks about, he assisted in, all, in creation and in, in all things that are made. For, uh, John 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. 
And so I dare say that we really would find it hard to even think about anybody that can have that kind of a beginning to resume. And that is, he was in the beginning. But then the second thing we can think about is that Jesus was endorsed by angels. Again, who would endorse you? When we think about Jesus, and as before his birth, and the angel speaking to Joseph, the angel came to Joseph, what did he say about this child that Mary was going to have? Over in Matthew 1, verse 21, he says two things. One is his name, and that is he bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. Oftentimes we struggle with family names. Joseph and Mary had no problem with that, did they? Right off, Jesus. The same Old Testament Joshua, which means God saves. And then he goes on and says, where he'll save people from their sins. And there's the mission statement right there. And why I came here to save us from our sins. And the angel said, that is what he's going to do. He's going to save the people from their sins. And then only that, but also he's endorsed by God. What did God say about Jesus? Over in Matthew, the third chapter, when it deals with the baptism of Jesus, we find in Matthew 3, verse 16, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased. Can anybody think of again of a higher recommendation, a higher endorsement to God himself? Can you imagine being there as John is baptized, Jesus brings by the water and description given to us there, and that voice out of heaven saying, basically, listen to him. It's mentioned again over in Matthew 17, chapter, on Mount Transfiguration. And there it says that, he said, this is my blessed son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, listen to him. And so when it comes to recommendations, we have Jesus, as far as endorsement, we had him at the very beginning. We have the angels speaking about him. We have God speaking about him. But not only that, but also if you go over on the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost, we find in verse 22 of Acts 2 chapter, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you. Now, again, just kind of attested by God to you, you know, Nicodemus says something about the fact that Jesus worked miracles. Those miracles were given to prove Jesus was who he said he was. Those miracles came by the power of God. And so all these things happening was God showing us this was indeed his son. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. There's no reason on the day of Pentecost for those people to look back and say, you know, we don't, we're not sure about who Jesus was or where he came from. And we have plenty of evidence given to that. And in fact, as we look at Nicodemus again, I just stress this, a teacher, a ruler of the Jews, a teacher of the law, a rabbi himself, said that Jesus was a, I put here a great teacher, but he said actually a good teacher, but we often refer to him as the master teacher, don't we? <coughs> and so here's the teacher. And as you look at this here, we think, okay, well, okay, that's a recommendation. What are some qualities for really good teachers? And there's a number of things we look at, as the Bible points out to us, and we, have, we recognize that there's our daily activities of being in classes and having to teach ourselves. And, and one is impartiality. Have you ever gone to a, a class, maybe started, and you just realize automatically that? That teacher has their favorites. Whether it's this person here because of maybe their last name, or this person here because of uh, their personality, and this person, that, that teacher just likes this person more than anybody else. And, and, and we would want in our teacher a person that doesn't show favorites, that treats everybody the same way that, and, and that's one thing, even the critics of Jesus recognize that Jesus wasn't playing favorites with one party over the other. He didn't play favorites with the Sadducees or the Pharisees or with the poor or with the rich. He wasn't in the job playing favorites at all. And Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me all, that means everyone, all you who labor, give rest, uh, have waiting, I will give you rest. 
That is the invitation to everybody. That that's an open invitation. It's not like you said, okay, you don't like it, you I don't like, or you can be saved and you cannot be saved. No, Jesus said, you want to come to me? Come on. Anybody come to me? That's impartiality. And as you look at it, we find that even the critics of Jesus recognized the fact that he was impartial. In fact, one thing that kind of made him well sometimes angry was the fact that he, he was impartial. If he had actually played favorites with the Pharisees, you know, they would have liked that. If he had played, played favorites with the Sanctuaries, they would have liked that. If he had played favorites to the, the, the rulers, the scribes, they would have liked that. But he didn't play favorites at all. As you look, and this is not just vain praise, but this is true. When they recognized Matthew 20, verse 16, and they sent him their disciples with and said to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. And teach the way of God is truth, nor do you care about anyone, nor do you regard the person of men. We know you're teaching the truth, and you don't care who it is. You know, there are times people ask questions and we kind of think, man, I hate to have to answer that question because of who the person is. We don't want to hurt the feelings. Or maybe somebody else has questions and think, I don't like that person. I'll tell them because I don't like them. No, he gave them the same answer no matter who they were. He was impartial. Another good quality of a teacher is they possess good character. Today, a lot of times in the press, news events, you find teachers that have caught doing despicable things with the students. Drugs, drinking with them, uh, maybe the language they're using with them, maybe some other things that are going on that they get caught with their students doing and we think, man, that, that just shows how morally bankrupt that teacher is. And, and none of us would want our, our child to be in their class. We would want a teacher that would set a good example for their students, wouldn't we? Don't use foul language, that, that kind of thing. Well, you think about Jesus, how does he describe for us? Peter, 1 Peter 2, verse 22 says, He committed no sin, nor was the seed found in his mouth. He didn't lie, he didn't mislead anybody, he didn't get hedged to the facts, and he, he simply gave them the truth. And over in 1 John 3, chapter 5, it says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So we look at this teacher of Jesus, they didn't find any fault with his character. Again, if they could have found something he had done wrong, if they could have found some kind of sin with him, they would have simply discredited him. They wouldn't have had to kill him. But then also that he understood the subject. Have you ever been in a class where you're listening to a teacher and after a while you think, and maybe you said out loud, like, does this person really know what they're teaching? <laughs> have they actually studied the subject before? Or have you, even worse, have you ever been the teacher trying to explain something and realize that in the middle of it, you know, I really don't understand this at all. I don't understand what I'm talking about. When we talk about Jesus and his answers, whenever they ask those questions that were intended to trick him, and the Bible says testing him a lot of times, so that meant that they were trying to trick him. Or they're trying to find a subject, a question, and he would say, I don't know the answer to that. Whenever they did that, what they found out was that he understood the subject over in Matthew 13, verse 54. And when he had come to his own country, taught them in their synagogue, so they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Where did he get this understanding from? Well, they saw Jesus, and they knew that he was not from one of the schools of the rabbis. That he, was, he had not been formally educated by the Jewish scholars that day and age. But he gave them answers that were from the scriptures. And they knew that his answers were right. Not one ever said, you're wrong about that. When he answered them, they remained quiet. Or they just left. But Jesus is somebody that understood what he was talking about. And so when we read about him and see his answers, we have to understand he knows the answer to our questions that we have. And not only that, but also, they had the same reaction at the end of the, of the uh, 
Sermon on the Mount. And Sermon on the Mount, you know, where did this man get this authority? And they understood his answers were indeed true. And so he understood what he's talking about. But not only that, but also he understood the subject as a student. And understanding the student is pretty important also because sometimes I've been in, in classes where a teacher that I'm not convinced really didn't know what the subject was, but he did not understand his students. And what I mean by that, you may ask a question, trying to find the answer, and if they didn't get it the first time, then you know, you don't have to try and give them a different answer. I explain it better to them the second time, and he couldn't do it. It was simply to sell the same answer. He didn't understand the students. And so Jesus, as he they talked to the people, they understood what they were going through. Whenever somebody today says, well, Jesus doesn't understand me. He doesn't understand the sorrow I feel. He doesn't understand the pain that I'm going through. He doesn't understand what it is to live in this world of sin like I do. Hebrews said, no, he does understand exactly what you're going through. And Hebrews 2, verse 17, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren that he might be merciful and faithful half priest and thank the hand of God to make fish aid for the sins of the people. And what the second chapter explains to us is that he took on the body of flesh so that he could be one of us. So that that body could be offered on the cross for us. But notice there that he was like us in all ways. And therefore he can say, I understand what you're talking about. Many times we may think they, you know, they don't understand, but yes, they do. They understand when their students are getting it, when they're not getting it. And then also that they are good and fair in their final exams. I've had teachers that have been hard, but a lot of times I walk away thinking that may be a hard teacher, but you know what? They're fair. And as the thing about that, what I mean, what I mean by that is that they they ask questions that. Requires to think, but they have talked about and gave us the answer about, about that. But sometimes you may have a teacher and they give you a question and you think, that question is just intended to trick us. <laughs> That's all it's intended to do. And, 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 and we think, think that because of that, that I don't like that teacher because they were unfair in their breaking system or they're unfair in the questions they asked us. Well, you want to think about Jesus, he's going to be fair. Over in Acts 17, verse 30, it says, I know, Truly these times of ignorance God will look, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed them which will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this by all who are rising from the dead. That word in the middle of that verse there, because he has appointed a day which he will judge the world in righteousness. That means fairness. That means in the quality of God being righteous. And so we can't on day of, of the judgment day, we, we can't look at God and say, you're just being unfair with us. He's already given us the answers. He already tells us what he wants us to do. And so we have, we have the answers to it. We have the means of entering into heaven. We, we have fair judge and we have fair exams. Now sometimes the teachers, they, they, they do make enemies. And we see with Jesus. And that Jesus, when we look at his life, we find in John 15, verse 25, says Jesus made them, they hated him without pause. And it's literally what I said in that verse here. They didn't have a reason. They just didn't like him. When they brought Jesus to Pilate, and they wanted Pilate to do something with him, and, and this is what I said, that he looked at them, he recognized us for envy, they delivered him. Everything else was just smoke and mirrors, was simply pretend. Pilate was afraid because he realized the reason Jesus this man before him because of envy. And that made him afraid. Well, let me end a lesson here by simply making this point here, and that is the reason why you should let Jesus teach you. Why all of us should let Jesus be our teacher. And, and the first reason is that to make you wise. I like teachers that actually, while we're in a class, I think, you know what? I'm better off because of being in that class. They taught me something I did not know. 
the elevated mind, love one known, to my ability to do something. And we looked at it, and Jesus says, you listen to me. And you know what? You'll, you'll be better prepared for life. Over in Matthew 7th chapter, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew 7, verse 24, says, Ever, whoever hears these things of mine, and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who built a house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds would be on that house, and did not fall for it, found it on the rock. And we, we're going to have rain to come in our house. In our life. We're going to have a storm to come into our lives. We're going to have issues and problems come to our lives. But if we build our life on Jesus, what do he say? You'll have the foundation, you'll be able to withstand it. You'll be wise. The second thing is, to be happy. You take the young child, you know, our, our grandchildren are now kind of like, I got to think about this, they're like seven and three, no, excuse me, we're going to just look and be like, we don't have one seven, five. <laughs> I was off by two years, okay? Five, three, <coughs> two, it's going to be one. And you take those grandchildren, sometimes you teach them something they hadn't done before, and they're so happy because they've been in that. And it may be that just that, that first step that they, they take, and they're happy, or may how to pick up things and put it, and, and when they finish a the task, their, author, their response is, I did it. Yeah, I've done that. But well, when we do what Jesus says, in John 13, verse 17, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you to do them. Happy is the idea of blessed, by the way. But when we do what Jesus says, we're going to be happy we've done what Jesus says. And it may not be immediate, but we will be happy we've done what Jesus says. And then also be cleansed from sin. That our sins washed away by his blood to make us pure. In Mark, the 16th chapter 15, he said, Go to all the world, preach the gospel, every creature. He believes that baptized and saved, but he does not believe we condemn him. If we want to be saved, what we have to do? Believe in bad times. So if we want our sins washed away by the blood, what we have to do is to repent. We have to confess that Son of God. We have to believe it and be baptized. There's no other answer than what the Master Teacher tells us. And so we need to let Jesus be our teacher. Because as we look at it, they have eternal life. That's really what this life's all about. We're kind of that time of year now where People are graduating and they, they get to celebrate the accomplishments of any one grade, going to another, getting a high school diploma, or getting that college degree, or getting that certificate from that school that says you can do this here. And those are great things to accomplish. I don't want to minimize those things. I know those students have worked hard and put out hours and made sacrifices and, and done all kinds of uh, uh, monetary sacrifices in their life. But you know, no matter what degree you receive, now let me say this again, no matter what degree you receive, it will never equal the value of eternal life to be with God. And so we need that eternal life. And as John 6, verse 16 said, Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life. This is when a lot of folks have turned away from Jesus because teaching got hard. And Peter said, you're the ones with eternal life. And that's right. We need to listen to him. And so with those for hands to go ahead and open your song books to the one that's been selected here, 294. Go ahead. If, if, if you have never obeyed the gospel, if you have never confessed Jesus Christ, Son of God, or repented of your sins and been baptized for forgiveness of sins, maybe you don't know what it all means, maybe you have some questions in your mind, feel free to ask those because we want to help in any way we can for some of our all of us to have the hope of heaven. And we're here to this morning in need of prayer of saints for any reason. Why don't you let us know? So we can do that also. John 14 verse 5 says that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to Father through him. And so is he your teacher this morning? Do you become a student? Respond to the invitation if you wish to as we stand and as we sing.